One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. This is our paint-along schedule. Uh, today's the 9th of April. We're painting Garbron Firepath, the Ranger. And uh, in this series of 12 videos, we've got three left to go. Next week, it's Juliana, the Herbalist. Uh, then Giannis, the Greek Mage. And then finally, Boren Ironbrow. I just want to mention Boren Ironbrow. That is the only one in this series that's going to be on a Friday instead of on a Sunday. That's because we have a convention to go to that weekend, so... Uh, the last one, Born Iron Brow, will be on a Friday. And uh, if you have suggestions for particular minis you'd like to see, uh, get in touch with me, message me through Facebook or send me an email or whatever. And uh, we're going to take a break for May. I'm running a painting contest and doing some other events in May. And then we're going to kick off again first weekend in June with uh, a new series of 12 videos going June, July, August leading up to ReaperCon. And uh, if there's any particular minis that you would like to see in those 12 weeks, just make sure you send me a message, let me know, and we'll see if we can add them into the uh, to this schedule. All right. So, Gabron Fire, uh, Firepath. Um, I was looking back over some of the videos uh, that we did already and uh, discovered that... Um, we, we, we tend to take kind of a similar approach most of the time. And uh, so this this time, today, <laughs> exactly, Zox, yay, ReaperCon. Uh, this time, I'm going to do something a bit different. And quite often, when we're painting a figure that has sort of an overall low visibility color scheme, like everything is gray or everything is brown or everything is dark green, it can be hard to achieve a good visual separation of materials. And uh, so I'm going to take a different approach today to do that in a different way than you may have seen done before. Now, most people, uh, when you're starting out, you will basically just take a wash and slap a wash over the mini. And, and that works pretty well. A lot of people like to use Reaper's Brown Liner, which is a lovely dark, dark paint. You thin it down, just spread it over the whole mini, and that puts dark brown, almost black color, basically into all the, uh, the little crevices on, on the figure. Um, what it also does is it leaves a whole lot of water stains and other kind of stuff on the figure. And sometimes the, the position of that dark line that you get doesn't really match up with where we want a shadow to be. So um, we're going to do something different. And there's a, there's a reason that I'm doing that differently not just to to focus on making sure we have nice strong shadows between surfaces it's kind of be like you look where your fingers meet you get that strong shadow where the two surfaces meet that's what we're going to emulate today but also because um, this approach is skill building and take the approach that we're going to take today is a good way to build your brush control and a way to learn to read the miniature to improve to improve your overall lighting so instead of just slapping a wash on, what, what we're going to do is that we're actually going to manually, systematically put a dark line around every object. And at first, I, I, you're probably all going like, no, we're not. I'm out of here. Quit. Done. But it doesn't take as long as you might think. And um, it's very good practice, practice for getting into the habit of dark lining which means going in at the end of painting the miniature, almost at the end, and reestablishing the separation between materials with a dark line or a shadow, which is something we're going to do again today as well. So the uh, th that's, that's the plan. We're going to dark line everything. We're going to use burgundy wine, a nice dark, almost purple color, and we're going to draw a line around everything with that. And then uh, we're after that, we're going to base coat. Uh, and then from the base coat, we'll do a little bit of shadow, a little bit of highlight, and you'll be able to see how the separation of materials works. And hopefully we can get that done within the, the three hour time block we're planning. 
So the, the color scheme that we're going to use, uh, we're going to use, obviously, burgundy wine is our shadow color for most things. Tan skin is going to be the skin tone. You can use any skin tone you want. want. It doesn't really matter. Um, I'm planning to highlight the skin tone with new copper. Uh, new copper and rosy skin are very similar, but the new copper is a little bit more um, vibrant, a little bit more uh, saturated. We're going to use hone steel for the metallics. We're going to use ruddy leather for some of the leather. We're going to use harvest brown for some of the leather. We're going to use polished leather for some of the leather. <laughs> We're going to use tan leather for some of the leather. This guy's got a lot of leather. So we're going to try to separate the different leather materials. And then uh, he's got this lovely cloak. We're going to use that cloak. 9011 leaf green. Just a standard kind of mid-range, mid-value, uh, slightly warm dark green is going to be our cloak color. And then we will use creamy ivory to highlight everything if there's time. And we'll probably use ruddy leather to shade most things. But we'll see how that goes. That depends how much time we have as we go through. So step number one for dark lining. So this is before we do any base coats. Okay. And it's a different approach. It's not... Um, a lot of people will base coat, shade, highlight. And this is a different approach. We're going to... Dark line, base coat, observe how much shadow we've got, and then maybe add more shadow, add some highlight. That's that's the plan for today. Um, I'm going to use a little bit of flow improver. And the reason for that is to slow down the drying time of the paint. Now, dark lining and this lining approach I'm about to take if you have to keep going back to the palette and reloading your brush again and again and again, it can take a long time. So my plan is to use a fairly large brush. Large brush. Uh, I'm use this size two Rares, Rosemary and Co. Okay, just because it's got a nice long uh, bristle. The bristle holds quite a lot of volume of paint. It has a nice point on it for doing fine lines. So I can load it with a lot of paint and go continuously without the brush running out of paint, which lets me do lots of lines. Uh, another approach would be to get a great big uh, synthetic brush, something like this, was this a size, oh my gosh, a size seven, okay? Grab a great big synthetic brush, a brand new one that has a, still has a very, very good point on it. And you can probably do most of the mini in one go out of that brush. If you don't use the flow improver, just which is, acts as a little bit of a retardant the paint on the tip will dry up before you even use up the paint in the in the brush so a uh, little bit of um, retardant will help another approach is to use a big sable brush uh, this so this size 2 rosemary and co is longer than it is fat if we look at a size 2 8404 Brand new 8404, never touch water. <laughs> it's from my secret stash. Okay, so that's a Rose, uh, Raphael 8404. Those have a great big bristle on them. Huge belly. They hold a ton of material. Uh, and this one has a very good tip on it. It's obviously brand new. It's literally the first time I ever put it in the water. Uh, this would be a, a great brush for doing this approach too. Holds tons of volume. Very precise brush won't dry out on you. So those are different brushes, different approaches. What you don't want to do is get something like, I don't even have one on my desk. Uh, here we go. A triple zero. <laughs> you don't want to grab a triple zero synthetic, something like that, because these synthetics hold practically no volume. It's a tiny little brush. It doesn't hold a good point for very long. So what will happen is you go and do one brush stroke, be out of paint, the brush will go flat, have to clean it, load it, do it again. So you'll end up going palette to mini, palette to mini, palette to mini, palette to mini, clean, palette to mini, clean, palette to mini, clean, palette to mini, non-stop. And then you'll snap the brush, you'll throw the mini, and you'll never paint again. Um, I have heard people say, the palette's right there, what difference does it make? But when you make 50 trips to the palette instead of one, 
that's a lot of your painting time. So uh, use, the, use a brush of appropriate size that's going to be good for the job you're going to do. All right, so there's my puddle of um, burgundy wine. Just going to add a tiny touch of that flow improver to it to start it moving. And I'm just going to roll the brush in the palette. I already got a ton of paint up in the ferrule. Uh, I don't really want that. That's going to dry solid on me and not be too nice to my brush. So I'll clean the brush. Probably shouldn't use my best brush to, to mix paint, but, you know, that's where I landed today. So I clean that off, reload it. It is key to roll your brush in the paint. Make sure you have a nice point on the brush, but also a good load of paint in there. Okay, so that brush is loaded with paint. It doesn't go all the way up into the ferrule. It's got a nice point on it. It's ready to go. And now we can, after Jeff's been talking for 10 minutes, oh, 15 minutes, look at that. We can get into the reason why everybody's here, and that's to paint. Okay, so I'm going to be a bit systematic about this. I'm going to start with something very easy, and that's the arm and the, the arms and this uh, big coat that he's wearing. That's probably the easiest thing on this mini to do. So what I'm looking for is anywhere that there's two surfaces meet. So for example, this pouch meets the arm. So there's a line in there. The arm meets the coat. So we put a line around that. The arm goes down over the pouch along this glove. We put a line there. Between the glove and the and his sleeve, we put a line in there. And you're going to hear me say, put a line in there, one million times now in this video. So anywhere two surfaces meet, so like this belt across his chest, we put a line around that. There's like a line painted in the mini, or sculpted in the mini, we put a dark line in there. Between the coat and his hood, we put a line. And we're going to work our way down, around, and then we're going to go clockwise around the mini. So we did the upper part of that belt. Let's do the other side of that belt now. And actually, it starts up behind the hood, so we'll start there, and then we'll start on the bottom of the belt. And just run your brush, the point of your brush, along the side of that belt, all the way down, around the belt pouch. Separate the belt pouch from the belt. Separate the flap of the belt pouch from the belt pouch. Anywhere two surfaces meet, we want to put a line. So the coat goes over that belt. We put a line there. There's the flap of the belt, the loose end. I think it's, uh, there we go. Around the belt there. On this uh, belt buckle, there's a little leather strap before the belt buckle. So that gets a line. The belt buckle gets a line. The tongue of the belt separates from the buckle around the buckle so i think you get the idea by now i'm going to put a line around everything now i want you to notice how many times have i reloaded my brush so far one there's the first time i reloaded the brush so you load the brush properly and you're going to be able to work very quickly and not waste a lot of time reloading the brush. Now, how precise do I need to be doing this? Not very. Okay, if I make a little bit of a mess, it doesn't really matter. Why is that? Because I haven't done the base coats yet. Okay, so what I'm doing is putting an initial shadow in before I put on the base coats. So it's okay if these lines get a little bit wide. In fact, as I, as I work my way down this part of the coat to the leg, I can see in here like, just as usual, I forgot to tell you my light direction. This is my light direction. You see how this side of the base is lighter? That side of the base is darker. So on this mini, my light is shining this way. You can really see it from his leg there. I got a bit of extra airbrush spray on there. The light shines this way. So that part of his leg, the inside of his leg, that is all going to be in the shadow cast by that coat. So I can actually paint the whole inside of the leg this color. Same thing with this boot working my way down. The inside of this boot, I can paint that whole half of the boot that color and make it really really shadowed okay so you don't have to be super precise and in fact at times you can be deliberately uh, deliberately make the lines really really big for this little bit of leather scale we just run the brush along the bottoms of all the scales 
and we go back and paint those later they will start out with a nice shadow along the bottom edges and that'll help us give a nice uh, separation of each scale when we go to paint the uh, well, when we go to base coat them okay so the coat there's a line along the coat between his armor and the coat coat goes alongside of the boot and then underneath the coat along his pants there we go I think that's most of that side of the coat keep going around so between the cloak where he did that line so down alongside of the boot and then where the boot touches the ground we put a line around his foot we do that on both feet and the same way as we did the inside of that boot all one color we can do the same thing on his other leg give that a nice strong shadow on the side away from the light there we go so now we're working on this sleeve so we put a line around the cuff of that glove and then in his hand we're going to put a line around every finger so if your brush is not very precise like mine is pretty wide here one trick you can use is you instead of rolling the brush in your palette just push it flat so that when you lift the brush up it's flat one way but it's got a really sharp point when you look at it the other way and then when you go to do your lines put the edge of the brush into those spaces so you can put lines very neatly in between shapes like fingers you get a lot more precision out of a brush which might not have the best tip on it that works really well with sable brushes it doesn't work quite as well with the the synthetic brushes and there we go let's keep outlining the fingers there we go on this sword he's got the, the hilt on there which actually you can't even see it right now the separation between the blade and the hilt we'll put that dark line in there and now we can tell the materials apart same thing on the other side. Now we're here. We did the pommel. There, there's the sleeve on the back between the glove and the cloak. And then we're going to do the same thing in the back along the side of the cloak. Now this cloak, this part of his whole body is going to be in shadow. So we can make that line on the back of the cloak fairly big. Now, what's next? Working our way around the cloak. So we've got the bow. We'll just run this along the back of the bow between the bow and the cloak. Now uh, we'll notice as we do this that this piece of his cloak has a very deep folds in it. We can paint the bottom of those folds this color too. Nothing wrong with that. And that'll give us a little bit of uh, enhanced sh uh, shadow when we go to do our, our shadows later on. We'll outline the bow. And the bow has got these little marks on it. I think those are leather straps which hold the bow to his backpack. So in addition to putting in our shadows, part of what we're doing here is also reading the mini. Getting used to the layout of mini. We'll notice any details that we might have missed at our first glance. And that'll help us do a better job of painting it. I think this bit of the handle, I think we'll paint that whole thing this color. Because it's got all those tiny little deep grooves in it. And then when we come back to paint it later, we could use dry brushing. Um, do the same thing on these arrows. I'm just going to paint all the arrows this color. But then I'm going to do a line between the quiver and his blanket. I'm going to outline each of the leather straps which are holding the quiver on his back. And then the folded leather at the bottom of the quiver. Okay, so now all of his shapes are pretty well defined. I can't 
from you guys can see the top of his shoulder, but I can't from my uh, perspective. So we're going to save that and do that in a minute. How's the focus looking? Good morning, Valandar. How are you today? All right, let's keep going. Reload the brush. So now I'm looking at this blanket. So I'm gonna, there's a line between the blanket and the hood. I'll put a line there. Between the blanket and the cloak, there's, there should be a line in there. The two, anywhere that two surfaces touch, we're gonna put a line. Little straps around the blanket. go and because the blanket is rolled <laughs> there, you can almost see that in the screen because the blanket is rolled where the each of the two surfaces of the rolls of the blanket meet we're going to fill in that dark line there we go I don't know if I was the DM and the the player said that they were going to do their their backstory in comic book form, I would be very excited to see that. That's a pretty cool idea. We'll keep doing the outline of the cloak. And now we're down by this belt pouch, so we're going to put a line around the belt pouch. And then a line separating the flap from the pouch separate the pouch from his arm and then we'll continue that line around his gauntlet on his sleeve and now we're looking at this uh, actually we've missed something here we're going to go back a step this edge of the bow stave didn't get a line so we'll put a line around that and in the same way as we paint the 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 low parts of these uh, cloaks this color we'll do the same thing on the front part of the cloak not on the front, on this part of the cloak that's in front of the, the the bow. Since our light is coming that way, right, the back edge of all of those is going to be almost completely in shadow. So we can just paint the back halves of those folds like that. And with that in mind, we can do the same thing on this side of the cloak. Because that whole side of the cloak is in shadow. Okay, so now we're starting to define the entire lighting of the miniature in this process. And it hasn't taken that long. We're 80% we're, we're of the way through. Uh, we're at about 10 minutes of painting so far. So I'm going to go around where the axe, uh, where the glove touches the axe and make a line. Where the axe touches the cloak, we're going to make a dark line there. There you go. And then the top of the glove on the axe handle. All the way around. And now the same thing as we do on the other hand, we are going to separate all the fingers. So I'll do that trick again and I'll flatten out my brush. There's that flat brush. And we'll go in between each of the fingers with a nice line of dark burgundy wine. Here we go. Now, you might find that if you're just using the same color constantly and not cleaning your brush very often, it might get a little bit of dried paint going close to the ferrule. Just keep your eye for that. If it starts to happen, just, you know, clean out your brush, reload, carry on. Okay. So, these lines around the head of the axe, I think the Sculptor might have intended that as like, I don't know, a, a repair to the axe head or something. So that might be a bit of leather, might be a brass wire, I don't really know. So we can pretty much paint that however we like. Uh, they've got this rivet here, or this pin going through the axe head. We paint both, paint around that. 
which probably means there's no wedge if there's a pin going through it. And uh, so we'll do a line around where the handle of the axe comes through the axe head. There we go, getting close. Now, last area to do this to is gonna be the hood. So we'll start at the front on the hood. Now, the hood comes over the shoulder. There's a fold in the cloth there, so we'll put a dark line all the way around. And then as I'm looking in the face, the hood touches the face and the hair. So we'll put a dark line all around his face. Doesn't matter if you get a little bit of this on his face. In fact, if you wanted to, you could fill his eye sockets. Not going to be a problem. And let's paint his mouth as well, where his lips touch. Okay, so now we've got that well defined. And the last bit is the area I couldn't see before on the top here, because of my perspective. So I'm just going to turn him upside down, get a better look at that. There we go. And I can paint all those lines. So there's a little belt pouch on the top of his belt, his quiver. We're going to paint around that. There it is. Let's see if we can get a better angle in there. There's a little leather latch. Oh, and look, there's a mold line that I missed. Go. Did I get everything? Nope. Still a couple spots that I missed. I'm going to have to <laughs> take it off camera for a second. I can't quite. Ah, uh, there it is. Okay, so the cloak goes that way, and there's a strap that comes out from under the belt pouch and goes around the bow stave. Okay, so there's this little strap here that connects to a little strap there, uh, there. <laughs> there's no way I can, it's right there. And then it connects back up to where the belt pouch is over his shoulder. Okay, so there's uh, almost everything is, is done. So we'll just spin them around a couple of times, look for anything we missed. I notice I didn't do all of the belt buckle or this strap on his shoulder, so we'll fix that now. There's a line there, all the way around the belt buckle. Miss this spot here. All the way around the belt buckle. There we go. And if you want to, you can look for other areas that are going to be in shadow, like the bottom of this glove. And you can put this color anywhere you think you might want to have a bit stronger shadow. Say, bottom of this gauntlet. In that armpit, that's definitely going to be in a shadow. But just take a moment, rotate them around in your hands. And one trick is to look at them from the lit direction. And if most of the stuff you can see, you can make out the different shapes pretty easily. But nothing is painted black or painted dark purple. That's pretty good. So we'll look in the opposite direction now, which would be that way. And most things should look pretty dark. If there's anything on that side that you can see, opposite the light direction, that's still pretty light colored, you can go back and darken it up. So I'm going to do the bottom of the hilt, the whole bottom of the hilt, the bottom of that pommel, the bottom of his arm, Bottom of that gauntlet. I think the back of this bow stave could be painted all this dark color. There we go. And if we really wanted to, we could paint the back of the blade as well. Let's just paint kind of the bottom part of the blade. Not the whole thing, just the bottom of it. And what that'll do is it'll make the the lower part of the metallic paint, because metallic paints are fairly transparent, uh, it'll make it look darker. The top will look lighter. And we won't do that on the other side. Okay. There's a few little folds in the cloth. Paint those dark, that tear in his leg. What else? 
any anywhere that two materials meet that you can see. Look at that part of his cloak, right at the back, way back between his legs. That's not going to get any light. Well, it's going to get some bounce light from the ground, but not very much. So we're not worried about that. Let's just paint that really, really dark. There we go. Same within there. Bottom edge. You turn the mini around, you can just get the right angle to see right in there. Darken it all up. Okay, I think we've got what we need to do at this point. Yep. Now here's a fun trick. This is not beginner painting, but it's an idea to keep in mind. We know which way the light is shining. So we know where his shadow is going to be on the base. The shadow is going to be between his two feet. So we can just paint in this color on the ground. And now we've got a fancy drop shadow. Which, let me tell you, any drudge at ReaperCon who sees that you've taken the time to paint in the shadows, they're going to like that. How do I know? <laughs> I'm just hoping. I know that when I see that on a mini, that's what I like to see. It means that the person is thinking about the light. And if you're not thinking about the light, well, it's time to start. Okay, well separated shapes, lots of things ready to go. I'm just procrastinating a little bit to give anybody who's out there painting along a little bit more time to get caught up. I know there was a couple of people locally that were working on it. I'm just going to check the Discord. No, anybody who's watching is on Twitch at the moment. So, um, all right. I'm going to do one little thing here, a little bit of a trick, which is to make the, his his blade is sculpted quite large. So one of the tricks we can do to make the blade look a little bit sleeker, a little bit sl more slender and sharper and shinier, is we can paint one whole plane of the sword a darker color so i'm going to paint there's there's like three planes right the front edge the flat middle and then there's a back edge i'm going to paint the whole back edge this shadow color and that right there just that little bit alone makes this the sword look uh look smaller and that's going to help make the miniature look a little bit more uh refined when we're done do the same on the back edge just for fun. Okay, so I think I've got everywhere done. So that took 20 minutes to do that. And was that time well spent? I think it was. Because now I've I've learned more about the shape of the miniature. I've learned where my highlights are going to be, where my shadows are going to be. All those things are pretty, pretty obvious to me now. And uh, I've also got a head start on the job that most people hate when they get to the end of a minute, which is doing all the dark lining. I like it, but it's done. <laughs> so we could get away with not doing it again. It's done. Probably will do it again later though. Okay. So now we can start base coating. So the colors we were going to use was going to be tanned color for the skin. So tan skin tone. That'll be the first base coat that we do. So we're going to do tan skin. Put that right on the left side. Doesn't matter what skin tone you use. Uh, I chose tan skin because he's a ranger. He's out in the sun all the time. But you can just pick whatever skin tone you like. He doesn't have very much skin showing. So um, this is not a hugely significant decision. But one of the things we are going to be cautious of right from the get-go now is that we don't want to completely cover over any shadow. So anytime I go to put on a brush stroke, I pull the brush strokes are going to move away from the shadow. And I don't want to cover over the lines that I've already painted completely. I might have to paint over them partially, like on his cheek here, that line is way too big. So I'll paint a little bit on his cheek, but I'm not going to completely remove the shadow. I'm going to be a little bit flow improver because this paint is a bit thick today. Same thing on his other cheek. Oh, too much paint on the brush. I'll start in the shadow, 
but pull the brush strokes away towards the light source and leave the shadows. So I just I don't want to completely cover the shadow that I put on. And that's because we want to have that shadow line to show the separation between the different materials on the figure. I'm not going to paint his mouth. I'm going to leave his mouth as it is. Paint his chin. Forehead. Now, it's hard to tell at this stage where this mini has sculpted eyelids. It's hard to say. Doesn't look like he does to me. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to give this guy the simple two-step eye. I'm going to use this skin tone to paint the whites of his eyes. And he's going to be looking that way. So the way the two-step eye works, I've already got his eye sockets painted dark. I'm going to put one dot on his, uh, on his eyeball on the side away from the direction that he's looking. Just enough so that it looks like we've got the whites of his eyes from that first dot. Oh, made a big mess. That didn't work. Fix the focus here. You can see that better. Okay, it does look kind of look like he's looking in a direction, but it's not as good as I wanted it to be. So before I keep going, I covered over too much of the shadow is what happened there. So I'm going to get a nice sharp brush, grab a nice pointy one. I'm going to paint the eyeball back in with this same shadow color. Just give a little bit of the eyeball back. Now, if you mess up completely, I'll just do it again. Uh, you can just completely refill the eye socket with the shadow color and try it again. And that's what I'm going to do. Now you're probably wondering yourself, why did he use the skin tone to do that instead of using a lighter color? I could have waited to use a lighter color, but if I do the eyes now, they're done. Don't have to worry about it later. I'm going to do the same thing I did before. I got that light dot. I don't know how visible that is. too bad. So I'm going to do the light dot on the left side of his eye from my perspective so that it looks like he's looking to his, his left to the right from my perspective. So the little dot goes on the side of the eye opposite direction we want him to appear to be looking. Uh, his eyes are kind of sculpted on there. Looks like the eyeballs actually have pupils or irises or something sculpted, which it could also just be a flaw in the in in this particular cast, like this particular mini that I have. It may not be in all the minis, which might be why it's getting to be so difficult to get a brush in there to paint that eye. It's not normally that difficult to paint eyes. There we go, that'll do. Darken up that mouth a little bit more. Okay, good enough. Face is done well enough for this figure. Okay, so there's the skin tone done. Next thing we're gonna do, we are gonna do the green cloak. Yes, we're gonna do the green cloak. So the green cloak is gonna be leaf green. Yeah, I, I, I prefer that they, they not be sculpted, Valandar. Um, who was it? Uh, Dennis Mice uh, was one of the sculptor. He, I mean, he died a few years ago, but uh, I really loved all of his sculpts. But he was a guy that he always sculpted the pupils and really makes it difficult to, uh, to paint the eyes on his sculpts. All right, so there's dark green, or what is this, leaf green? But not many people do that anymore, you know, like it, it was a, 
it was a thing of the time, I guess. But uh, people not, most sculptors don't do that anymore. All right. And then, so this leaf green, I'm gonna paint all of the cloak this color. Same thing applies as before. We don't want to cover over the shadows completely. So anytime we go to put on some paint, we want to pull the brush away from the shadow. So like this edge of the cloak right here, okay? We're going to put the brush gently onto the cloak and then do our brush strokes in a way that we don't completely cover the shadow that was, was painted. And we'll work way up under the shadows, or on the shoulder, same idea. And it applies underneath as well. So under there, I don't want to put paint over that shadow. We'll do our brush strokes pulling away from the shadow. Okay, so we've kept that shadow between the cloak and all those other surfaces. I just realized I grabbed the wrong brush. That's why this, the brush is kind of trashed. Go back to the one I was using. That nice, uh, rough, uh, what was it? Rosemary. Okay, so load that back up again. And now do the same thing on the other side. There's a tiny little bit of this cloak that shows uh, under there, Take that little bit of green, and now we're going to do the, the edge of the hood, and again, we don't want to cover the whole shadow, I'm going to say that like 30 times, don't cover the whole shadow, just paint in a little ways, but then leave the shadow, so normally you might paint this, this green right up to the edge of the skin tone, in this case, we are not going to do that, we're just going to leave it and have that dark purple line separate the two surfaces for us. Same thing on the inside of the hood. Okay. And now we do the main part of the hood. Don't completely cover over the shadow. You can you can encroach on it, and you should encroach on it. You don't want a gap between your base coat color and those dark lines. But don't completely cover them over. This is a really good exercise for learning some some better brush control as well. There we go. I'm kind of curious now as to whether that um, those eyes are sculpted or not. The pupils are sculpted. Grab a different one. No, I think it's a problem with the uh, with the mold. There must be some damage to the mold or something. Because I don't think the pupils are sculpted on those. All right, continuing with our green. All right, so there's a little bit of the cloak shows on that shoulder. Now you want to be careful not to um, get these straps. These straps are going to be leather. So the piece, which is the cloak, there's a little bit of a strap that goes to the bow stave. And it's really the, 
the cloak is just a little sliver showing here. But here's the thing. If you get the wrong piece, what do you do? Well, you just go back with your purple, reapply the black line, and it'll separate those two pieces out again. No problem. There we go. Neatly separated. Now, we're going to follow the line of that cloak around the back behind his arm. And the same rule applies. Don't completely cover the shadow. Now, we already painted this a very dark color, right? So why am I painting over it again with green? Well, what's going to happen is the green is a little bit transparent. Translucent, we should say. And anything that I have completely covered with the burgundy wine, that burgundy wine is going to show through the green and sort of desaturate it a bit. So the green painted on the back is this green in this zone right in here. So I'm painting right over that piece of shadow. That is going to look darker than the green I painted up on the top of the hood where white is showing through. Okay, and that's a, that's a useful property of acrylic paints, that they're somewhat translucent. And that's why blending, glazing, blending uh, works so well, because the colors show through each other. Okay, there we go. And then same thing in here. There's a belt that goes along to his belt pouch. We want to start below that. Don't really f want to fill in all those folds. Just want to catch the raised parts and leave the shadows dark. There we go. Does it matter if we make a mistake and paint too much of the shadow? No can always go back and fix it later or even just pretty much fix it right now keep him working around the cloak towards the front under the axe and there's a little bit of it that shows on the front above the axe just a little bit I want to be careful to try not to completely cover that shadow around the base of the axe we go. So there's our cloak. Darker in the back because of that translucent property. Slightly lighter in the front. And I see a few spots where it's a bit patchy, particularly on the top of the hood. So I'm just going to put another layer on there to fix some of that patchiness. Now, so far I haven't thinned the paint, but for this second coat I could put a little bit of water in there just to thin it a little bit. And that second layer can be thinner. It's one of the great things about Reaper paints. When you work with them on the wet palette, uh, certainly for base coating anyway, they do not need much in the way of thinning to go on smoothly. Okay, so that's good. We can let that dry, and now we're going to do the metallic base coats. So this time I'm going to grab that home steel, I'm going to give it a really good shake up. Always want to really shake the metallics well. And we don't want to leave the metallics sitting for too long on the palette. They tend to fall apart pretty quick, so I'm going to put the paint up here in the corner in the corner there and I'm going to grab not one of my nice sable brushes I'll grab one of these synthetic brushes just gonna make the brush slightly damp don't want a lot of water in it just so that it, uh, the paint will flow better and 
I'm going to paint that sword and the axe now. I'll start with the axe. We'll do the axe head. And same thing as before. I don't want to completely cover over those dark lines. So I'll just work up close to them and then pull the brush away. There we go. Again, this is a good exercise to get used to painting precisely, to painting around details. And it's a uh, practice that will be very useful to you later when you're doing painting that's more difficult. So practice it on easy miniatures. That way you've got the skill when you need it doing something more difficult. Paint that rivet. I don't remember what our plan was with these little wires on this axe head, whether it was going to be leather straps or what. I've just decided they're going to be metal. So how am I going to do that? I'm going to wipe most of the paint off this brush. And then I'm just going to very lightly run the edge of the brush across those carved wire shapes. And now those are going to be metal wires. I think uh, in this case, this ranger is pretty smart. He wouldn't use wires unless he needed to. I think the, the handle of his axe is split somehow. So he's using the wires to keep it from completely falling apart. That's my story. Stick with it. Okay, so now we're going to do the blade and the rest of it. So I'll start down here. Let's start with the pommel. Some of that pommel is leather, so I'm not going to paint that silver now. I'm just going to paint the ball shape of this pommel. And once again, don't completely cover over the shadow. This is just a single light coat of paint. Doesn't mean that it's thin, just not putting on a huge amount of paint. And as it dries, you'll be able to see that the dark colors underneath will show through. So if you made quite large lines initially, might need to paint this a couple of times to, uh, to, to, to thin them down a bit, like to, to cut in and make those silver lines more narrow. But uh, probably not these. But if you do have like really thick lines, you might, like I say, you might have to do a couple of coats with this. Looks like it's working pretty well for me today. There we go, top of the hilt. I work my way all the way around the hilt first. I'm not going to paint the bottom of the hilt this color. I'm just going to leave it all shadow. There we go. And now what I need to do is paint the blade. Now I want to keep that dark line that I painted between the blade and the hilt. And my light is that way, is that way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by putting the brush close to, but not right into the shadow. Just start putting on a little bit of silver. My brush strokes are pulling away from the shadow. And then I slowly, carefully work my way closer and closer to the shadow. But not completely covering it. I want to keep that line there. And then the brush strokes go away from that shadow. I'll do the same thing on that side of the blade that I made dark. But in this case, I'm just going to paint mostly right over that. And when it dries, you're going to see that that edge should still look a little bit darker than the front edge. Yeah, maybe not. I might have gone too heavy with that brush stroke. Do the same thing on the back. Start close to where I want to keep the shadow. And my brush strokes pulling away from the shadow. Same thing in there. Start where the shadow and the silver meet. Slowly work my way into the shadow with the brush strokes pulling away. 
that's going to make the bottom half of the blade darker than the top half. That's one of the reasons it doesn't look right on, on the cameras because of the glare from the very strong lights. But in person, you, you it would look a little bit different. You can still see that dark color showing through the metallic. There we go. Let's see if I can get an angle so you can see. There, you can. There. And that angle, you can see how the base of the blade is darker than the top. Okay, and we're just going to leave that like that for now. Actually, I missed a spot, so I'm going to fix that. Missed a spot right there. Wow. Happy with that. Uh, we could also do the, all the belt buckles and things now, since we're being careful about not covering over shadow. So there's a bunch of belt buckles. There's this one right in his chest. A little bit of silver on there. And the one down on his main belt. Now normally, I wouldn't do that. But because of the way we're painting, where we're keeping the uh, different surfaces separate, we can take that risk uh, that that detail might get a little bit covered over later. But it probably won't because we're being careful. All right, and now we are into the leather. Now, I am going to pause just for a moment. I'm going to swap out this uh, paint water because it's full of metallic paint <laughs> toward the end of my brush again. I keep forgetting that brush is broken. Uh, just to get the... Uh, there's a lot of silver metallic flakes floating around in that water. I'm just going to swap it out right back. Leather. So what different colors of leather are we going to need? So I've got four different leather colors picked out. Um, I think we'll start with his coat. But basically, I think we'll do all of the armor the same sort of leather. Yeah, so we're going to use ruddy leather. Ruddy leather is going to be the base coat for those main leather pieces. We need a fair bit of that on the palette. And go back to my brush that I was using. There we go. Nice clean water. All right. So what is going to be ruddy leather color? It's going to be anything which is like an armor piece. So that's going to be the gauntlets. The main part of his, his uh, jacket here, his sleeves, it looked like a different material to me. Uh, then it's going to be... All that scale, the boots, and you know what? I think we're doing so. We're doing a lot this color. So let's start with the jacket. So it starts up here on his chest, and we want to keep the shadow. So don't just slather on the leather. Just paint each section on its own and keep that dark color in between. If you're just starting out, this might be a challenge for you, but it's worth learning to do this, learning to separate different materials, learn a bit of uh, precision. The payoff even though you're going to paint slower, is that your brush control will improve, which even in the very short term means that your speed will increase. So even though you'll be painting slowly initially, as your brush control improves and you start making fewer mistakes, your overall painting speed is going to increase greatly. That's one of the reasons this is worthwhile to do. It's all about brush control. A little bit of that shoulder again, same idea. Don't paint the shadow. We'll start under his left, uh, I guess it'd be his right arm. Try to paint those little straps that are holding his coat together. Paint them separately from the rest of the coat. You can paint the hilt 
of that dagger on his hip at the same time. I guess we need to go back and fix the uh, the metallics on those later. And then we're going to work our way down the coat again. Now I put all these little shadows in on the coat. I want to keep those. I don't want to paint over those. So I'm going to go in between them and pull the paint down and away. Keep those shadows. Nice light brush strokes. All right, what's next? I think next we're going to do the scales on the front of his armor. And I think this is going to be fun because we're going to paint all of these scales individually separately but that is not going to take very long so i'm going to start at the top and work my way down so it's the opposite of if i was shingling roof shingling roof you start at the bottom we're going to start at the top and i put the tip of the brush close to the top of each of these and then i'm going to pull down on an angle towards the right and just put one daub and by being very light with the brush stroke i'm only hitting one scale at a time i'll do one right in the middle here so you can see that, just painting one scale at a time. But by doing them in sequence that way, and having the miniature oriented to the right angle with the brush, just very gently I'm able to paint each scale one at a time, and very quickly. And I'm using that same brush, that Rosemary & Co. size 2, which means I probably won't have to reload my brush at all while painting these scales. There we go. And that's going to give us a nice separation between each leather scale because of that shadow that we've left in between. Even though that's quite a dark color. Okay, we have a good shadow between each scale. probably use a second coat of this color but where it's leather it can be patchy that's okay all right so there we go now let's do the boots next I guess yep the boots are next so I'm gonna start with his left boot I'm gonna start in by his heel I'm going to pull the brush strokes out of the shadow forward and not completely cover over the shadow. Same way by the sole of his boot, there's that black line we put in. Don't want to cover that over. And I do that working my for way forward to about the middle of his shin. And then I'm going to turn the mini over. I do the same thing coming in the opposite direction. I reach into the shadow from the other side and bring my brush strokes forward. I'm getting a nice color where those brush strokes overlap in the middle. And any area that I think should stay in shadow, I'm not going to paint. There we go. Do the same thing on the other boot. A little bit tougher because you can't really easily reach through. So on that one, I'm just going to start on the front side and work my way forward. Starting to look like a very, very leathery brown ranger. He's going to get even more leathery. Next thing we're going to do is going to be the gauntlets. 
So we'll do the same idea on the gauntlet. So I'll start on the back of the right gauntlet. And my brush strokes are going to pull forward from the shadow towards where the highlight should be, towards the light source. And I'm not going to completely cover over the shadow. The tops of each finger. And each finger painted separately, right? Because we got a shadow in between them. So I'm not just painting the whole hand. Paint each finger separately. Reach under at the front and pull forward. Okay, just double checked I didn't miss any spots. I did miss a couple little spots. Missed his whole thumb. A few spots on those fingers. There we go. All right, well, now we'll do the other gauntlet. Exactly the same way. By now you're all saying to yourselves, but Jeff, all this leather looks exactly the same. And it does, and we're going to paint even more leather that looks exactly the same. But we're going to be sure we keep that, that separation by having the shadow in between. And then we're going to make all the leather look different by using a different highlight color for different types of leather. So I've got all those other leather colors picked out. Top of the gauntlet now. There we go. Now, what else do we need to paint? The scabbard of the dagger. Forgot to paint that. Let's do that now. So there's a little metal piece at the tip. Metal piece. Up, up here where the uh, the hilt is, and the hilt and the pommel will be metal. So don't paint those, and don't paint over the shadows in between those surfaces. Okay. Uh, what's next is going to be... I guess it's going to be the quiver. It's not a guess. It is going to be the quiver. I'll start at the top, at the back, work my way forward. Once again, don't cover the whole shadow. So anywhere that I've got the shadow on left and right, I start on one side, pull out of the shadow towards the light, and then go to the other side, do the same thing, and then have those brush strokes overlap in the center. Keeps all those surfaces nicely separate and gives me a nice bright highlight. I shouldn't say highlight, but a nice bright base coat where the brush strokes are overlapping in the middle. There we go, looks pretty good. And now I can do the same thing those little leather straps that are holding the bow in place top and bottom and the bow handle looks like it's got like leather or wire wrapped around it I'm just gonna do a little edge highlight on each of those little shapes just gently catch them with the edge of the brush Uh, 
next is going to be the straps around the blanket. And then finally, we need to do all of the other leather straps. So that's, we're going to start with this one around his, as it goes all the way around his chest. Starts in the back under the blanket. That little bit of it there, right in there. Then the lid of the belt pouch, just the flap that's like the lid of it. Then the belt pouch itself painted separately. There we go. Okay, and then this belt goes all the way up his chest. Now we painted the belt buckle metallic already. So we don't want to paint that again. So don't paint the tongue of the belt, don't paint the buckle. There we go. Keep working our way up. right over his shoulder, little pouch on his shoulder. A little extra strap that goes down to the bow. Paint them all separately. There we go. So what are we left with? Cuff of that boot. Missed that a minute ago. Hmm, his main belt, I'm going to paint that the same color. So there's a little strap that goes up and down that holds the, the loose end. Paint that separately from the main body of the belt. Paint the loose end separately from all of those. And once again, don't paint the belt, but belt buckle, just paint that little bit of leather in between the parts of the belt buckle. If you make a mistake, doesn't matter. No, we can always fix it, but it's good practice. Okay. Everything's the same color. So let's just count up the number of leathers we've got here. We've got tan leather, we've got harvest brown, and we've got polished leather. There are three different leather colors we're going to do. So polished leather is going to be all the belts. Tan leather, I don't have a plan for that yet, and harvest brown is going to be the armor boots and gloves. So armor boots and gloves, all the belts. So we're going to use tanned leather for his pants and his shirt. This is the plan. So we're going to paint his pants and his shirtless. Wow, the pants and the shirts are the same color too. Everything gets painted ruddy leather. This is what I was, this is why I chose to do this process, right? Because like I was saying, rangers uh, tend to look pretty much all one color and uh, can be hard to keep the different materials separate. So we're going to separate them by using different highlight colors and those dark lines in between the different shapes. I'm going to do his shirt on the other sleeve. Okay. 
very brown ranger. Okay. So let's do his, sh oh, forgot his pants. Forgot the pants, we'll do the pants. There we go. Okay, it looks very dark, but everything still you can still kind of tell the difference between shapes. So let's do the shirt and the pants first with the tan leather. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a little bit of tan leather in the palette. It's Reaper 9031 tan leather. And what I'm gonna do is I am going to make a half step between ruddy leather and tan leather. So I'm going to mix the two of them roughly 50 50. And this is going to be my first highlight on the shirt and pants. And then I'll just do straight tan leather on the shirt and pants. So the, the half step, everything I've already painted, I'm going to start with the left sleeve, just focused on the raised areas. You don't want to completely cover over the ruddy leather we just painted. And my brush strokes all go towards the light source. Flip them over to come from the other direction. Start down by his elbow. And my brush strokes all go upwards towards the light source. And the light source is this way. Go. And now we do the other arm. Start the back. Take our brush strokes towards the front. I like it. That's already making those look a little bit separate. I'm going to do the pants. But on the pants, I don't really need to do too much. There's not very much of the pants showing. I make sure we don't paint this on the cuff of the boot by mistake, just on the pants. There we go. I think I did paint the cuff of the boot by mistake. Uh, I said, what the difference is, this, which I thought was a cuff of a boot, is actually part of the pants. We'll paint that this color. That makes more sense. Okay. Now, clean my brush off, and I'm just going to go back and do the same thing again with just straight tan leather. Light brush strokes pulling up towards the light source. Very light brush strokes. Come from the back towards the front. Start close to the elbow, but not as far down as last time. Same thing, the brush strokes go upwards. And then overlap the brush strokes in the middle, facing towards the light. There we go. And then we do the other arm. Start fairly high up on the other arm because it's already 
mostly in the shadow. Start on the back, fairly high up, and then work your way around to the front. Go. So now we've got shirt looks different. Let's do the pants right now. Just a left leg and the right leg. Barely any highlight needed on the left leg. It barely shows. There we go. Started the same base color. Now they look pretty distinct. Okay, what's next? The armor. The armor is going to get the harvest brown. That was the plan. Let's put a daub of harvest brown. Ugh. Look at that junk on there. Get rid of that. Same thing. Put some of that on the palette. Now, this paint is quite transparent. I don't usually feel like I need to make a half step with this color. So let's just do maybe like just like one quarter and let's do one third ruddy brown or ruddy leather and the rest harvest brown that should be enough to though the idea is to put the two colors closer together make a half step and then that way the transitions are easier to build okay so armor plate we're looking for so that starts with so that's gauntlets boots and the jacket so let's start up here on the shoulder Below the green cloak, above the belt, I'm going to reach in there. It's going to be a fairly large highlight. And the brush strokes go forwards, not covering the shadow. Trim of that jacket the same way. And then I'm reaching in under the armpit. And bringing the brush strokes forward. A little bit of it shows underneath the belt. And we'll assume that these two little leather staples or whatever they are, are the same color as the rest of the armor. We'll do the left hand part of the top of his coat the same way. Not covering the shadow, all the brush strokes move towards the front. Under his left arm, uh, his right armpit. We don't have to reach all the way in, just reach a little bit of the way in. because That's mostly in shadow, it doesn't really need much of this lighter color. Brush strokes still go forward. Next is going to be this leg. And this leg, the light is right about here, right? So the center part, the brightest part of the leg is going to be in line with that, which is going to be basically a line along there. That's the brightest part of the leg. So all the other brush strokes are going to pull from the shadow onto that highlight. Same thing, pull up from the bottom in from the cloak and overlap the brush strokes in the middle there give us a highlight in the middle of the leg on the other side the light is coming that way so the front edge of that is going to be the lightest over here so we'll reach part of the way back not all the way to the little dagger scabbard just part way and the brush strokes will pull forward towards the light source. I really like this Harvest Brown. This was the Warm Browns Triad for, for leather. Really looks good. Love it. Okay, boots and gauntlets. Let's start with well, the right gauntlets easier. Start on the back. We do the top of the hand. And the top of the highlight is going to be just forward from where we can see, right in there somewhere. So we're just going to do a few little brush strokes, uh, pulling from the shadow side forward towards that highlight. There we go. Then we go back around, do the tops of the knuckles. Then we do the tops of the 
knuckles closer to the front. And then the fronts of the fingers. Leather on the palm. There we go. And do the same thing, just reach down and pull up from the shadow towards the top of the arm. Don't completely cover the previous color. There we go, nice leather gauntlet. Same thing on the other arm. Start fairly low down because that's basically facing directly towards the light. Do that top part of the arm, top part of the thumb, tops of the fingers. And when we switch them around, that bottom part of the hand is in the shadow, so we'll focus on the top of the hand. Pulling the light upwards. There's little raised bits on the back of the hand, but the back of the gauntlet. There's like a little fold in the gauntlet there. So that's where I'm going to start my highlight, it's at the edge of that fold. And then work my way forward. Okay, give my brush a quick clean. And now we need to do the boots. Same idea, exactly, nothing special here. Start close to the shadow, work our way forward. We just remember we have a, the, the sole of the boot. Uh, is it separate from the, the, I don't know what you call it, the main part of the boot? Just, if you can, paint the little line on the edge of the sole separately. Like that. Same thing on both boots. Okay. Uh, okay, that's it. Now we're going to do the leather straps. Leather straps. Leather straps are going to be polished leather. Now this color sometimes is not very opaque. Let's see how it goes. There we go, got a dollop of it. Same idea, we're gonna mix a little bit of ruddy leather into it, and then go back and uh, do a half step. So there's our half step, polished leather with a bit of ruddy leather in it. Do that one first. So this is for all the straps. So we'll start up here with the belt pouch on his shoulder, right in there. Don't know if I'm gonna be able to get that without hitting the sword. Then that bit of the strap. As we work around our way around from the back, we want to focus on the part of the leather strap that faces towards the light source a little bit more. Now, quite often, leather belts are going to be kind of weathered where they get damaged by belt buckles and things quite a bit. And if you feel comfortable with that, you can do a little bit of weathering. But for today, what I'm going to do is I'm really just focused on the lighting side of things. So I'm just going to paint those, making sure I don't cover over the, um, the shadows. Keep working my way around all the belts. So this main belt on his uh, around his waist his sword belt pommel or the uh, handle of that sword and just a little bit on that dagger scabbard okay I feel like I've forgotten something oh I forgot the scale armor 
to go back and do that scale armor in a moment. Uh, what's next? Straps on the back. So there's the belt comes around underneath the bedding. Belt pouch under his arm. And then the belt, the leather strap on the bedding, really just bringing the brush strokes forward towards the light. Top edge of the quiver the same way. And then just the center of mass of the of the quiver, leaning a little bit towards the light if possible, but it's a bit uh, it's a detail that doesn't need too much refinement, I don't think. Just enough to make them look distinct. Okay, that's enough of that. Now we're gonna do the thing that I missed, the scale armor. So there's my Harvest Brown with ruddy leather in it. So same as I did when I painted those scales initially. I'm going to get the brush lined up on an angle. And I paint from this kind of about two thirds back forward to the edge of each scale. With the brush strokes going towards the front. To make sure the color is lightest on the edge of the scale that faces closest to the light. There we go, little highlights on each other. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just get straight Harvest Brown. And we'll do all the armor bits again with that same color. And uh, this is going to really make them look quite orange. So, But don't be alarmed by that. This paint is going to darken as it dries. And it's going to give them an orangey kind of boiled leather look as that leather dries or as that orange color dries. So we focus on the side towards the light. Any raised areas get a little bit more attention. And try to keep the brush strokes flowing towards the light source. Don't have to reach very far back towards the shadow. Really focus towards pulling this color towards the light go same thing on so that's the, the the coat we'll do that same thing on the leg I did last time with that highlight right down the center of the leg facing towards the light and then we'll bring the color up from the sides to meet that same thing from the back, the other side of the coat. I think I had a little bit too much paint on my brush that time. And there we go. Looks pretty distinctive. Gauntlets, same deal. Again, just focus really towards the light side. So I'm not even going to turn the thing around. I'm just going to focus on the shapes on the front. Top of the arm facing the front. Top of all the fingers facing the light. Top of that gauntlet is pretty much facing directly towards the light, so we need to turn that around there. We'll do. And the front of the boots.
go. Last bit to do on the front there for the armor is the scales. One more time. Well, one more time with this color anyway. Really focus towards the front of each scale. You can see how fast I'm doing this. This just comes with practice. Key is to line up the brush to a comfortable painting position and then move the mini to line up with it. And you can be very confident and quick because it's the optimum position for control. All right, now we need to do all those belt straps again. And they are just going to get straight polished leather, but I think the polished leather is a little bit too transparent. So I'm going to add in just a tiny touch of tan leather into that mix just to make it a little bit more opaque. Hopefully that will do the job. And then we're going to pick out all those shapes again on all the belt buckles, all the belts, but really just focus on the edges of them closest to the light source so that we're just kind of picking the shapes out to make them a little bit more visible. Again, do not cover over the shadows that we already put in there very carefully. Yeah, with that just that tiny little touch of Tan leather really changes the nature of that paint. Belts. sword handle, just the corner edge of that scabbard, not much more than that. And then the belt pouches from the back. Camping roll straps. The edge of that quiver. Straps on the curve, I'm not going to do the main part of the quiver, just those straps now. Straps on the bow. Go. Pretty happy with that. So now, if you wanted to, you could go lighter. We could add some kind of uh, lighter opaque color to to change the character of anything we wanted to um, let's say well let's say the scales right we could take that orange and add maybe a little bit of the tan skin to it that's going to desaturate it a little bit lighten it make the value higher so lighten the paint and then if we come along we could do really just the edge of each of those scales with this lighter color. And so the sun was catching the edge of them. And with the base colors we've already laid in, that's really easy to do. Just give them that little bit of extra definition. on the cuff of his boot, maybe around his ankles where the boot leather would get damaged, get folded and torn up. We can put a few little dings and 
dashes along the edge of the boot on his toes where the toes get worn. This lighter color. Remember, this is the armor color lightened up again, right? Just a little bit of extra detail. Toes of his filthy boots. Uh, we could do the edge of that leather coat. Do an edge highlight on there. Front and back sides. A few little dings and scars. Like he's been out in the woods for a while. Let's put a little bit more skin tone in that mix. Lighten it up a little more. And then up here on the upper parts of the armor, use that lighter color to do a few little things along the edges of different plates. Along his armpit. Top of that cuff on the gauntlet. And then I'm going to do a little bit on each of the joints. So fingertips of those gloves. Knuckles. Just the knuckles facing the light. Not all not every knuckle on each hand. And this bit of the wrist that tends to get worn. So we'll put a little bit of damage on that. There we go. Give it a little bit of leathery detail. Okay, pretty happy with that. And I think the last thing on that we need to do, we didn't paint the axe handle. So I'm going to take tanned leather just straight tanned leather. I'm going to paint the axe handle. Uh, this is the this would be the base coat for a bit of a wood color. So there's a little bit of ring of wood shows above his hand. There's the bit that shows inside his hand. And then a bit down towards his hip. Paint all of that. This color is going to take two coats, I think. And we don't want to forget the bit of wood that sticks out the top of the axe. Which really should have a wedge in it. But what are you going to do? under his hand okay I'm gonna go and do a second coat on that pretty much right away it's almost dry I got distracted, started redoing the highlights on the on the sleeve. Sorry, didn't mean to do that. Okay. Now that axe handle. I think I made that I, I ate up too much of the shadow there. So I'm gonna grab my shadow color, which was the burgundy wine. Mix up a little bit more with that glow improver. And I'm just going to bring back that fine line around there in the head of the X. Now, if I was feeling saucy, which maybe I am, I don't know, 
Got a good day painting. Let's put a wedge in that. What? How do we put a wedge in that? We're going to put two parallel lines. Like that. And when I go to touch up the metallic, I'm going to paint the line in between those two silver. Okay, there should be a wedge in there. Okay. Now, what to do next? The next thing we got to do. Well, we're actually pretty much, I mean, that's basically a painted mini at this point. Um, what should we do? Let's do... Let's paint his blanket. Let's take the burgundy wine and put some tan skin into it. So it's half burgundy wine, half tan skin. And we're going to paint that color on the blanket. Because you know this guy is not going to have like a fluorescent fluorescent red blanket. He's going to be kind of low key. And we'll just paint that color on his blanket. Oh, and I forgot about the bow. Let's paint the bow tanned leather as well. Don't worry, we're not going to leave it this color. We're going to put a much lighter color on top. How much time? We've got? Oh, we're only two hours in. we got lots of time. Lots of time. As usual, I'm trying to keep quite a bit of the shadow color. What I want to do is make it look like the bow is just kind of resting on his back, but it's not like in his back, it's resting above his cloak. So there's a nice strong shadow around it. And then as we get closer to the front, nice, nice highlight there. We're going to have to decide on the color for some feathers for this guy, too. For his uh, arrows in the quiver. I don't know, maybe this guy has uh, some very distinctive looking arrows, as possible. Okay. Speaking of the arrows, we filled in all the arrows with that burgundy wine color. So, we can now paint each of those arrows separately. Just by running the edge of the uh, brush sideways along each arrow. Tiny little brush stroke. Pick out the arrows. Oh, nothing to it. I think now what we need to do is add some tan leather to the color of our blanket, lighten up that blanket color. And put some highlights on the blanket. Now, something fun you could do, you could do this with tiny little dots, make it look like the blanket is furry and fuzzy. 
soft. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. I'm going to do it though. It only takes a couple of seconds. Tiny little dots. Same rules apply though. Don't uh, don't totally cover the previous color. Don't totally cover the shadows. And that's going to make it look like the blanket is a different material from the leather, which is good. If this guy was a Scottish Ranger, we could do a little bit of a tartan pattern on his blanket. I'm kind of fond of doing that. Like he's a, got a hunting blanket, you know? Might be for another day, though. There we go. There's a blanket picked out. I feel like I want to highlight the green. So for the green, let's do that. Grab a dollop of the green, move it off to the side, and we could either use the skin tone or the tan leather. Either one of those is a good color for lightening up that uh, that green. And we just pick out the edges of the cloak closest to the light source. On the top of his head, like the light is coming this way, so the art highlight on his head is going to be quite large, but really focused towards the light source direction. So pretty much the whole side of the hood facing the light. Now, if you feel like this cloak is too light, we can always go back and shade it. It's pretty easy. Before I do that, I'm just going to finish anywhere that the, the surface of the cloak faces the light, so like these folds. The surface which faces the light, I'm adding this highlight color. I'm not painting it on the shadow side. Maybe just a little bit down there, but this, this bow is going to cast a shadow over most of this cloak. So I don't really want to do too much of it. That's probably enough. So to shadow this green, if I feel like this is not really well defined enough, not light enough, or sorry, not dark enough, well, we do two ways. One is we take the, the tan leather, go another level lighter, and then highlight all the same things again, just smaller than the last time, to really bring out the highlights on those shapes. Pretty straightforward, same things we just did. Okay, I'll do the job on that. Now, to, to shade it, what we would do is take some of that same green, and we want to darken it, right? And our shadow color was this burgundy wine. So if I put that in there, that's going to turn really, really dark really quickly. It might be even too dark. 
So what we can do is thin it a bit, put some off to the side here, add a little bit of water to it, not too much. And now anywhere I want to make the shadow on the green cloak deeper, I can paint this into the shadow. So I look for anywhere that I've already made a purple line, like so inside the edge of the hood here. I can put this color close to any of those um, shadows, like inside this, along his arm there, there's a shadow. So I put this darker color up against that shadow. On the back of his cloak, right in there, we've got that shadow space. So I can paint this color in there up against the shadow. And it might not seem like it's dark enough initially, but it'll darken as it dries. And if it's not dark enough, we can always do another layer. Go the back of the part of the cloak away from the light source. Okay, so the back of the cloak is darkened. We can do the same thing at the back of the hood. We've got these little folds in the hood here. There's one. Along the bottom edge of the, the hood, we can darken that. There's another fold in the hood back here. Faces away from the light. We can darken those. Basic, basic shadow on the side of the cloak away from the light. So now it's dark on that side, lighter on that side, but still pretty desaturated. It doesn't look too too bright. If you decide it does, like the, the, the green color has disappeared, you want to bring it back. Just grab some of your mid-tone green. You can do this with any of the colors if you feel like you lightened it too much. Grab any of your mid-tone colors, thin them down a little bit, and then you can glaze them back in. So we just put that very, so here's how thick that paint is, right? It's not very thick at all. And uh, I can put that back over the top of the stuff that I highlighted with the Tandia leather. And bring that green back if I feel like I was too, I made it too light. And that'll just somewhat restore the green color. Darken it slightly, but without totally losing our highlights. Pretty straightforward. Never hesitate to mix your paints into something new. If you need a new color, just mix it. If you want to change the color black back, just glaze the previous color back over. Go back and forth until you're happy. All right, I feel like we've missed a couple of things. Ah, yes, the silver. Let's finish the metallics. So now we'll grab that tiny little brush. At this point, this silver on the palette's probably pretty... Yeah, it's completely turned into chunks of goo. See that? So I'm not going to use that. I'm going to grab some fresh honed steel. And I'm going to put that on the little bits of metal on the dagger, right in there. So there's a little bit on the pommel, and then there's a hilt, and then we've got that piece of metal on the scabbard by the hilt, and there's a little piece of metal down at the tip of the scabbard. That was the metal that I missed. You could also paint some of these little tabs metal if you wanted to. Don't really need to. I'm pretty happy with that. Now our metal is looking way too pristine. 
Now, this is normally something I do right at the start, but I I forgot. So we can we can do a wash over that to darken those colors down. Now, uh, where this is like a, a, a basic paint along, normally what I would do is just use black paint, thin the black paint right down, throw a wash of that over, let it dry, and then touch the silver back up, and that's going to really darken the steel down. But today I'm going to use a different product. Today I'm going to use a Reaper product called Steel Wash. And this is this is quite a nice wash. And what it's designed to do is to darken and blue steel. And uh, it has quite a nice effect. I really like Reaper's Wash Medium. You can Reaper's, get Reaper's Wash Medium separately and add whatever color you want into it to make a wash. And this 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 paint is this steel wash is essentially that. It's that wash medium with some carefully chosen colors uh, to create the look of darkened aged steel. And I'm going to put some of that on my wet palette. Won't need very much of it. It's quite a dark color. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that as a wash over all of that, uh, all of that metal. So the axe head, uh, oh, really all of the metal. There we go. Load up my brush with that. And I'll do it on the axe head first, so you can see how it flows. And I'll just go slowly. You can see it will pool a little bit if you're not careful. So we just go across slowly and sweep it back to a point where we can lift the excess off the figure. I'll just lift it off at the back there. The same thing on the top. Probably have too much on the brush right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to load this up. Do it over the wires too. I'm going to wipe off the brush and just lift some of that excess off with the brush tip. I was too slow. I made a mess. Put that back on there. Okay, I'm just going to leave it now because it's already just about dried. I'll just do the other stuff with a little less. Okay, so pommel of this sword all the way around. And then I'm going to start at the top of the blade. I'm going to push that material, this wash down the blade. I'm just going to keep moving the brush strokes down, push it from the top to the bottom so that more of it ends up at the bottom. I should darken that up quite nicely. Do the same thing on the front. Keep pushing the wash down. There we go. And I do a little bit on the dagger. And I think I'll do all these belt buckles too. Dull them down a bit. The Woodland Rangery guy doesn't really want to be walking through the woods looking all shiny. There we go. You can see that that's not turning it black or anything, it's just darkening it down, dulling it. it makes it look a bit more like aged steel, which is what I wanted. And our, our shadow that we painted on at the start is still visible there too. All right, so while that's drying, I'm going to do a little bit more work on his face. Everything else except for the arrows is pretty much done. Do a little bit of work, I think, on the face and on the arrows, and then we'll finish the metallics and it'll be done. Oh, no, i got to do the wood still. Let's do the wood. Uh, we're going to have to do wood. I'm going to put some creamy ivory in the palette. It's Reaper Creamy Ivory. You can use any sort of warm off-white. You can even use the, the solid white and add a bit of yellow to it. It's easy to make your own. 
that's just to remember that I need to do this. So now I'm going to make a wash with the burgundy wine. Very, very thin wash. Remember, this is the color that's already in the shadow on the skin. I've already painted the eyes, so I don't want to mess up the eyes again. So what I'm going to do, I don't want a lot of the brush. It's not very thick. That's too much. It's better. So what I'm going to do is just bring the brush across from the light side to the shadow side slowly and let some of this burgundy wine run into the shadows of his face. And this can leave some wet marks there. It's going to leave some water marks. But our ranger is kind of an outdoor ruggedy guy. He's not going to have, you know, beautiful, perfect, smooth skin. Just try not to let it flow into the eye socket since we already painted those. There we go. And then I do the same thing with that same sort of a wash on the uh, on the wood. So I'm going to actually thin it down even further. Need barely any for this. You could do this with the ruddy uh, leather too. It worked just the same. And I'm going to put that wash, like really not much to this paint. I'm going to put it over all the wood. Oh, I forgot to do the little metal bit. We're getting lots of stuff today. A little bit of this wash over all the wood. So there is a little bit of a texture sculpted on the axe handle here. And this should help pick out a little bit of that. It won't pick out very much, but just a little bit. And then we we'll do the same thing on the bow stave. There we go. Go way down. If you're not sure, like, whether it's too much, if you do put too much on, like that, what you do is just your brush strokes move it in the direction of one of the shadows. Because this is the color that's already there in the shadow. So you can take those blobs and push them off into the shadow, and they'll land on something which has already painted this color, which means that they'll be invisible. Let's do that on the blanket, too. Super easy. You know, let's do that on the arrows as well for no particular reason. Just a way to give the arrows a bit of definition. So we don't need too much. We'll just let that flow slowly into the sculptured, the sculpted uh, texture on the arrows. Pick out the fletchings a little bit. dry and then we can there's all kinds of different ways you can do that uh, those fletchings now but they're essentially ready to go sorry I'm messing around I'll stop okay so now the skin tone should be dry we can go back to our tan skin we'll reapply the tan skin over where we did the purple wash. Give the skin a little bit more definition. Don't need much paint on the brush. We are like just a few seconds away, a few minutes away from this minute being completely painted. Let's pick out details like his cheeks, upper lip. Not actually his upper lip, but like the skin above his lip. Chin. I think this guy's been chasing halflings to Isengard. He's looking pretty tired. It's all right. And now I'm going to do another layer with the tan skin. I add a little bit of the creamy ivory to it to lighten it up. And just make his facial features stand out a little better.
Okay, so his brow, bridge of his nose, sides of his nostrils, top of his cheek. Pick those out a little bit. A little bit on his chin. Pick that shape out a little bit better. Make him a little bit better to find. Tip of his nose again. This guy's eyes are really sunken in. He might be an undead ranger wearing a skin mask. I don't know, man. That could be kind of creepy. All right, and then we do this something similar on all the wood stuff that should be dry enough now. So we'll take that creamy ivory, mix it into some tanned leather to do the first highlight on the wood. So what is wood? The staff is wood, or the uh, the bow. So we'll do the light side of the bow with this color. Focusing on the side facing the light. Doesn't take much. And just remember, I have to do the other side of the bow as well, back in there. Axe handle. Both sides of the axe handle. could highlight a couple of the arrows if you want to. I wouldn't do all of them, just the ones closest to the light. And if you're feeling keen, you could do another highlight with just straight creamy ivory. Thin it down quite a bit though. I'll do just a little bit of that on the side of the wood, which faces the light source. And on the tip of the bow. Okay. Do a little bit of that on the skin as well if you want. If you put that on his forehead, put that on his cheek, put it on his chin. Make him look even more like an undead. It's looking pretty sinister, this guy. Uh, so we did our steel wash. We can go back now and touch up the steel. So that would be like on the axe, that would be the rivet. Just put a little dot of light on the side facing the light. The edge of the body of the axe. Since I've got the silver in my hand and I've remembered, let's do that wedge that I faked. There, there's a metal wedge in that now, like they're supposed to be. A um, little bit on the, the head of this axe kind of bulges outwards around the handle. So that's going to be lighter. And then the axe blade is an exterior curve, like a 
convex curve. So we'll do the center of that a little bit shinier, like it's going to reflect the light. If you want to, you could do the edges of it as well. Totally up to you. There's a little bit. Okay, there's that done. Belt buckles. We don't want to just completely re-highlight the belt buckles. Just, just do like the corners of them where they might get worn. Just ignore that dagger in the back corner there for the most part. And then on this sword in his hand, that pommel sphere, with our light coming this way, it's going to have a highlight a circuit like a round highlight facing towards that light source the edge of that where it's a rounded shape you can see it naturally has a highlight um, from the light Just accentuate that a little bit same as on the other side and then we can do what we were doing with the blade earlier we'll start at the top and we pull our light up towards the top, make the top of the blade shinier. Just ignore that other side and maybe do the edge of the blade facing the light. Something like that. Not a huge fan of this particular metallic paint. Kind of letting me down at the moment. Gonna do the edge. On that side. I think that's enough on the back of it. I'm gonna bring back some of that wash on the back of that blade. Really darken that up again. This is the shadow side of the figure, why not? Could do that on that side too, just that outside edge. Make our blade look smaller and darker. Which will ironically make it look shinier. Okay, I'm happy with that. So the key takeaways from this process was that we lined everything at the start. We, we created a separation between all the different shapes at the start. And you can still see that first layer of paint that we put on everywhere on the mini. We haven't covered that shadow over anywhere. And that's what's making like the, the different leather belts, the, um, the leather scales, everything is a distinct shape because it's got that dark line separating everything. And uh, to finish that mini off, you could go back and do, if you needed to, if there's anywhere the dark lining got really covered over, you could go back and do it again. We could actually uh, go back and do it with black, or we could also do it with uh, steel wash. Where's that brush I had ready to go? Brush right there, ready to go. Seem to have lost it. Hmm. Oh, right in front of me, of course. All right, so what you could do, we take some black. Let's put some solid black on the palette. And you would mix the solid black and the steel wash. That's going to give this black a property very similar to a wash, which kind of beads up on itself. Okay, or th these, these washes beat up on themselves pretty easily. 
and that's going to let you make even finer lines for your uh, for dark lining. So if there was a spot you missed, or there's somewhere you want to bring the line back, let's say, like there's little folds in the the belt pouch there. I can use that to put a black line back where the lid of the belt pouch is. Where there's all these little tiny folds in the leather, I can use that to bring those shapes back. Maybe where the belt pouch is touching the coat, that got a little bit obscured. Essentially anywhere you want to bring the, the shadow back, you feel it disappeared. Pretty easy to do just by mixing that black wash, the steel wash with some black paint. Um, just be cautious about doing that with um, other washes and shades. Um, some of those do not react well to being mixed with other paints. Um, like for example, the uh, like Nuln Oil or Agrix Earthshade from Games Workshop, if you mix uh, other paints into them with water, uh, you can get some really unpleasant results. Um, and, and there's a few other ones like that. You just want to be careful do a test if you're doing something new like that. Not necessarily on the mini that you're working on. Try doing it on a base or something like that. I always keep a stack of bases handy for that sort of thing. I'll just give it a shot, see, see how it looks before doing it on the figure. But yeah, putting the steel wash with black paint works really well. That was something that Aaron Lovejoy taught us during one of his... Uh, uh, blending, uh, non-metallic metal class, actually, I think it was, he, he showed that, and it uh, works really well. It can work with some of the contrast paints, too, but again, just test it, test it before you do it on your figure. For something like these um, scales, you can line that up and run just a line along the bottom of every scale at once. Focus the shadows on those if you need to. Pretty easy to do. If you've done any kind of damage or scratches or anything, you can use this to um, accentuate them, put a, a dark line where the cut would be. All right, bring that damage out, same thing on the boots. We did some of that on the boots. Don't need to do too much of that. But yeah, so if you need to bring your lines back, that's how you do it. Do some more on that. Uh... line back on that sword. Okay, I'm just messing around now. All right, I'm pretty happy with that. Final step as always, paint the rims of the bases black. Not brown, black. Grab the wrong color, look at that. Throw a few plants on there, give them a bit of a varnish, and that guy's ready for the table for sure. Okay, so 
if you go and do this yourself, just be patient with yourself. Uh, it does take time. The first few times you do it, it can be really, really slow. So don't get frustrated. It comes uh, with practice and uh, it's a useful skill. It'll help you with your, to be ready to do more advanced painting later on when you, you'll find you have a skill that's really useful when you uh, go to do something more difficult. All right, I think that's uh, pretty much it for today. So thanks for your attention. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you for the next one. Okay, so just a quick update to uh, finish the video on our friend the ranger here. Um, something that happens fairly often, uh, particularly with Sirecast uh, figures, the, the plastic on the inside, I mean, they're, they're flexible, right? The surface is a bit like tempered, so it's quite strong. But the center of the plastic tends to be quite brittle. So if you put enough pressure on it, it doesn't just kind of break or crack. It, it sort of shatters. And uh, we've experienced this a number of times removing, removing bases from miniatures where you go to clip away the plastic. And instead of just cutting a bit of plastic away, the base splits, piece shoots across the room, takes, you know, bounce, ricochets off the wall like a bullet. And uh, so I finished painting this on video the other day. And uh, when I went to remove it from the base, we had a small accident. And uh, yeah, it just simply split right above his ankles. And you can see how clean that cut is. The exterior plastic seems to have held up a little bit better. But in the center, you, you could see the little kind of crystally looking uh, shattered bits where the ankles just snapped off which is what a bit is a bit of a disappointment uh, considering the model was finished and we're aiming to have this as a series of finished models for demos at painting classes um, so what do you do so the next thing is of course you got to fix the model so I'm gonna show you what we did went and grabbed my pin vise which is a small handheld drill um, I keep brass wire in the studio which is the same diameter as the drill bits and uh, you can see a little bit of that powderiness there. Let me zoom in just a touch. You can see that powderiness there. That's the crystal, uh, the shattered crystal bits. You can see a little bit right there how the exterior shell is a little bit stronger. So you take the pin vise, gently drill a hole, and then you uh, put a piece of that brass wire in. And you can see the length of that brass wire. That's how long the pin is. And it goes that far down into the ankle as well. So uh, drill the holes, put the pieces of brass wire in there, then take the brass wires, line them up against the legs, make a mark, and then drill out the holes in the upper parts of the legs, and then test fit it. Try, test fit everything to make sure that the model is going to sit back on its, uh, it's going to line up and sit back on the pins, and that the pins aren't too long to keep the crack from being completely closed and then uh, following that put super glue on the end of the pin and put it in the hole both hole, both at the same time a little bit of super glue on the top of these pins they don't need a lot of glue you want to use cyanoacrylate glue plastic glue doesn't work for this and then uh, just place the model on top and squeeze it until the uh, the, the crack is completely filled or com completely closed let it seal and what you're often left up with that left with then is the crack will be invisible it might be if the paint broke away you might have a little gap in the paint but you often end up with a little shiny bit of glue showing on the edge of the crack and then after that you've got to go back and uh, let it fully dry but then go back and varnish uh, over the glue and as soon as you do that like i used uh, just a matte varnish the same matte varnish as i would use to normally uh, seal the models and that little bit of glue just completely disappears. And then you're back to having your fully uh, intact, finished model ready to go. And so this is actually the model after the break. And I'm going to see if I can zoom in maybe just a bit more on that so you can see the crack. You can see just a dark, slight dark line there. right there. 
that black line is where the model broke. And you can see that after we put the varnish on there, this is just as shiny as this, as shiny as this, as shiny as the rest of it. It's all under the same varnish. And uh, that gives us our, our finished model. And there he is, ready to go on the gaming table, or it's, as this guy's fate. Uh, this is part of a collection of 20 models that we'll be taking to different um, events, conventions, uh, painting shows, model shows, painting contests, whatever, to show off the Reaper minis and to talk about you know our painting process and that kind of thing. So there he is, our finished ranger. And we'll see you the next time.